Thank you very much, uh, Luke. Uh, I'm David Montgomery, the Director of Christian Unions Ireland, and I want to thank Queen's Christian Union, which is, I suppose, one of our uh, largest uh, groups uh, to, for, the tr uh, for putting this on and for hosting it uh, this evening and giving up their normal night uh, to open it up to the wider uh, public. I want to thank my staff, particularly Johnny McLoon and Mark Hamilton, for the hard work behind the scenes to get this off the ground. Christian Unions Ireland is a network of student-led Christian uh, societies in over 30 campuses throughout Ireland. And one of our aims is to help Christians know why they believe and to encourage those who are not Christians to seriously consider the claims of Christ. You'll notice on your uh, seats uh, cards uh, with the Christian Union logo on it. Uh, and uh, that's because we have to take data protection very seriously these days. And we want to make sure we comply with all the regulations. So if you would like to hear more about events like this uh, in the next cu couple of years, then do please fill in and return those cards. Uh, and uh, that will keep us right with the regulations. Uh, we have been determined that, that all of these events that have been taking over, taken up place all over Ireland, uh, we've been uh, determined that they will be free of charge, uh, but folks have been asking about donating towards the expenses of putting them on. If you would like to do that, then please just go to our website, cui.ie, and there's means to give there by PayPal and, and other means. This is the second year we have held a series of lectures for the wider public under the title Reasons for Hope. And we're delighted to welcome to Belfast Dr. Oz Guinness, who has already spoken for us this month in Dublin and Waterford. Oz Guinness is an author, a social critic, the great, great, great grandson of Arthur Guinness the Brewer. He was born in China in World War II and was a witness uh, to the climax of the Chinese Revolution in 1949. He was expelled along with his family and many others in 1951 and returned to Europe where he was educated in England. He completed his undergraduate degree at the University of London and his DPhil in the Social Sciences from Oriel College in Oxford. He has written or edited more than 30 books, uh, including one on Doubt, The Call, Time for Truth, A Free People's Suicide, The Global Public Square and Fool's Talk. He has held many visiting scholarships and has spoken at dozens of the world's major universities, as well as to political and business conferences on many issues, particularly on the issue of religious freedom across the world. After Oz comes to speak to us, uh, there will be the chance for questions from the audience. Uh, and I want to again thank you for coming and give to uh, Dr. Oz Guinness, who's currently living in Washington, D.C., so he has come over from there, especially to be with us in Ireland. Let's to give him a warm Belfast welcome and welcome him to the platform. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Monty. Thank you all. It's a tremendous privilege for me to be here. I have had the privilege of speaking in a number of places, but I'm never stirred so deeply as when I come back to Ireland. And what better way to finish this time at Queen's? So thank you. It's a great privilege. One of the heroes in my life has been Sir Winston Churchill, whom I had the privilege of meeting when I was a boy. One of my favorite stories about him is a time he was asked to speak in Canada at a graduation. And it was before noon, and they knew the great man loved whiskey, and so they offered him some whiskey. He didn't usually drink before noon, but he loved whiskey, and so he said yes. So they went down all the members of the platform party, offering them all whiskey, and since Winston Churchill had done, they took some too. Until they came to a bishop at the end of the line, rather small gentleman who stood up to his full height and said in a loud voice, I would rather commit adultery than drink whiskey. <laughs> to which Churchill heard it, turned around and said, oh, I didn't know we had a choice today. <laughs> now I start there, not at a serious level, 
<clears throat> because so often across the world, you see Christians engaging issues of public life without really thinking. And I love the fact that what you do here through the Christian Union in Ireland is encourage people to deepen their faith, but also to engage thoughtfully with this incredible modern world in which we're living. Some years ago, I spoke at Stanford University. And a student asked me a question I'd never been asked before. If you could be a member of any generation except the one you were born in, which would you choose? I don't know what your answer would be. All sorts of fancy answers flashed through my mind in nanoseconds. But what I said was, I'd like to be a member, looking out on the students and graduate students, those of you tonight who are under 35, I'd like to be a member of your generation. Because those under 35 today are described as the crunch generation. In the sense that as the world has globalized, many of the grand issues have converged to create a gigantic crunch. And these issues, challenges, problems will have to be answered in your adulthood. Many of us older will have gone. Answer them well, and humanity can sail forward calmly. Answer them badly or not at all because of neglect or drift, and humanity could be profoundly in trouble. We are in a most extraordinary generation. And clearly, among the issues of our time, as an issue in itself, but as an issue which is bedeviling other issues, is the question of truth. And I want to open it up tonight in terms of truth for each of us as individual people, Certainly for those of us who are people of faith, truth for us in terms of our faith, but for all of us too, truth in terms of our citizenship and our engagement with the wider world. Truth. You remember when The Economist put on its cover the notion of the post-truth world. They picked it up because in 2016, the Oxford Dictionary pronounced that post-truth was their word of the year. And since then, that notion's been picked up all over the place, many people using it to comment on the lack of truth and others to deepen that lack of truth. And you can see that we're in the middle of a profound crisis and series of controversies over truth and what is the possibility of truth. I first became interested in this in 1989. Those of you who are older will remember that year was the so-called year of the century in the 20th century. It was the year the Soviet Union fell. Many of us can remember the graphic pictures that came in from all around the place that year. The joyous dismantling of the Berlin Wall. Flowers thrust jauntily out of the barrels of tanks. For me, though, or oh, you can think of the toppling statuary of heroes like Marx and Stalin and Lenin. But the most vivid memories for me were of the Velvet Revolution and November 1989, when night after night after night, a crowd of more than a quarter of a million jammed into Wenceslas Square in Prague to listen to the speeches of a youngish, slim, mustachioed figure of the dissident leader, later to become president, Václav Havel. And night after night, he drew the contrast between the Soviets and the Velvet Revolutionaries. Obviously, a huge contrast was the matter of violence. They were people of coercion and violence, and we, the Velvet Revolutionaries, would be people of peace. But one of the strongest contrasts was between the Soviets as people of lies and propaganda and coercion, think of the KGB, and the Velvet Revolution, whose motto was, truth prevails for those who live in truth. And night after night, the quick-witted Czech crowd picked up the cry, we are not like them. Not long afterwards, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, virtually a one-man dissident movement, 
brought down so much of the Soviet Union himself. And in his great Nobel speech later, that ringing line, one word of truth outweighs the entire world. Now, all of us who remember that day, you remember the applause and celebration right across the Western world. What heroism, what courage to do what they did. And yet, it was clear that we in the West, back then, did not have a similar view of truth to make such a stand. One word of truth outweighs the world. Truth prevails for those who live in truth. And you can see our Western world has suffered a deep and profound crisis and corruption of truth. So let me set out a number of areas that could be thought through in much greater depth than we have time for, but at least <clears throat> to open up the topic well. First, think of the different sources of the assault on truth. You could mention many. I'd like to mention three. Obviously, part of the assault, and the oldest and longest, comes from the history of ideas, and particularly the great German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche had a double assault on truth. On the one hand, he attacked it through what he called perspectivism. We'd often call it today relativism. Perspectivism, as Nietzsche said, there are many eyes in plural, so there are many truths in plural. There is no truth. His other assault was in terms of the will to power. There is no truth, so what is knowledge? What is understanding? It's an expression of the will to power. So there is no truth, there is only power. And you can see how his ideas, picked up particularly by thinkers like the French radical Michel Foucault, have come down into our world, and so almost everything now is analyzed and estimated in terms of power. And you can't be in a seminar or whatever for five minutes and someone will tell you we don't have enough of this person, that person, this representative diversity or whatever, because it's all a matter of power. There's no truth. Everything's power. The second assault came from the social sciences, and in particular, what's called the sociology of knowledge. The idea leaves people a lot of, uh, bedazzled for a moment or two, but the idea is relatively simple. People believe things and think things because they're somewhat shaped by their social setting. So the responsible form of the sociology of knowledge analyzes whatever passes for knowledge in any community, but it's not able to judge whether that's right or wrong. It passes the issue to philosophy responsibly. But since then, a more radical version has come up that everything, without any exception, is only socially constructed. There's no truth. As they put it in very simple slogans, there are no givens. There are no rules. There are no limits. Everything's socially constructed. So we can analyze what's happening now and deconstruct it and reconstruct it and so on. Endlessly. You can see that at the heart of the sexual revolution and in particular the studies surrounding transgenderism. Even science and biology doesn't matter. It's whatever you feel today that really counts because everything is socially constructed, a very radical notion. The third source is technology. Take a simple example. When many of us were boys, certainly myself, there was a saying, the camera doesn't lie. But of course we know it does today. Photoshopping. But now we're way, way beyond that. Did any of you listen to John Kennedy's speech the afternoon after he was killed? He was on his way in November 1963 to Dallas and the Dallas Trademark to give what would have been a very eloquent speech. And he was shot dead in the motorcade on the way. So they have the text. And they took the text and they took words from all his speeches, every single word there, 
and recreated a speech. If you listen to it, it's an early version of the machine. It is slightly mechanical, but remarkable. And people who didn't know Kennedy's voice, for instance, were pretty sure this was the real thing. The president was dead. Now, the point is today, you could take any video and put a politician you don't like, put them into some porn video or whatever. We are in a day of fake news of all sorts, and the capacity technologically for fooling people is very profound today. Now, put all those three together from philosophy, from the social sciences, and from technology, and you can look at other things too, and you can see that we have a profound corruption and crisis of truth in our world, and it affects everything. I mean, even this last week, were we to believe the chemical weapons? or were they planted evidence, and so on. And so you see more people, suspicious, cynical, mistrusting, and so on, and so on, and so on. And people attacking, believing conspiracy theories, and the problems go on endless, and they're all around us almost every day. Go on, though, secondly, to say, while at first blush we're in a world that's profoundly troubling, and it is, we should keep the long-term perspective. And if we look at human history in general, we can see two simple things that could give us hope. First, periods of skepticism never, ever last. You can look back to the sophists in Greece. They could make black, white, white, black, up, down, back, front, you name it. They were brilliant in their arguing, dazzling in their world plays, People's minds must have been spinning and they make people believe all sorts of things. But people can't live on skepticism. We have David Hume across the water in Scotland. In the 50s in Oxford, we have J.L. Mackey and a whole number of others. There are various periods of skepticism and our postmodern world is another one. But it never, ever lasts not because it's beaten down philosophically necessarily, but because humans cannot live on skepticism. Put that more positively, you can think of all the things, all the reasons for why truth is vital. We could take science, the whole notion of the discoverability of the universe, or at a, a humbler, more practical level, the notion of peer review. Some of us was discussing at lunch today the way that postmodernism comes even into science with the climate discussion or with the food discussion where politics and self-interest enters in and you don't really know what to believe. But science itself assumes and requires truth and science would collapse if truth were to collapse. The same thing is true of journalism. Without truth... Journalism would be only a rumor mill. Now, of course, there's a good deal of journalism today that is rather like a rumor mill. And you can see that unfounded allegations and rumors are cycled as news today and so on. But unless we have truth, we'll all be cynics and suspicious about our news. But at the end of the day, you can think of things like business, which requires trust. But above all, our relationships. Now, trust is so simple that people almost scorn it as trite. But if you think for a minute of a family or a human community or a neighborhood or a city or a country, how do you develop trust? And the fancy term today is social capital. Well, if you think for a minute, we're all making smaller or greater promises every day. I don't mean big ones like till death to us part in marriage or so help me God in public service. Those are very big promises. But every day, I see you at 11. I'll be there for lunch next week. We make all sorts of statements about the future, which, if you think of them, are promises. And the question is, are we true to our word? Do we keep our promises? I said 11, and if I don't turn up, I'm unpredictable. But as people are predictable, and are true to what they say, they become predictable and trustworthy. And you can see that their word is their bond, and societies have trust as a bonding between them. But of course, 
without truth, there is at the end of the day no trust. But human communities assume and require trust for relationships, for business, for journalism, for science, and one could go on. So although our crisis is very deep, there's no question about that, we should take heart, we can be sure there will be reactions to it in powerful and useful and good ways. The third thing to see is that those of us who are people of faith have a special stake in this issue. Because, put negatively, without truth, faith is bad faith. Bad faith was Jean-Paul Sartre's term for people who are believing for reasons other than the truth. And you can think of all the objections that have come in a similar way. Marx, religion is the opium of the people. The flowers on the chains. Freud, religion is the wish fulfillment, the projection of a father in the sky or whatever. Now, all those critiques are plausible if faith is not true. Now, sadly, there are many believers who give that impression. Why do you believe? Well, I've experienced it. But we don't believe it's true because we experience it. We experience it because it's true. Well, some say, well, I believe because it works for me. Thank God faith works profoundly. But it works because it's true. It's not true because it works. And there are too many Christians who have views of faith that are actually indistinguishable from bad faith. And you can see students who come to faith in ways that are less than worthy and then face the onslaught of some professor or some challenge after they leave university and they wonder if the whole thing's true and they just believed it because they were going along with the group or whatever. Without truth, our faith is vulnerable to the objections that it is bad faith. The Christian faith, of course, would be true if nobody believed it. And it would be false if it were false if everybody believed it. It's not true or false according to numbers or opinion polls or statistics or anything like that. It is true because it is true because it is true. <coughs> now, put more positively, we could say truth is important to faith, not because of philosophy, but because it is the tribute to who God is himself. In other words, Christians and Jews believe in their faith as true, not because they've been convinced by some philosopher's argument or some fancy syllogism. No. But rather we see as we meet God through Jesus and in the Scriptures, a God who himself is true. He speaks truly. He acts truly. And when we put our faith in him as true, we are giving him the tribute that is worthy of who he is. It's a matter of theology, not of philosophy, although philosophy is important in its place. But move on to the heart of the present discussion today. We need to weigh the practical consequences of the crisis of truth. And again, I can put it two ways, one negative and one positive. Both are important, although the first is easier to see, although the second is equally significant. Negatively, without truth, there is only power and manipulation. Now, if you think for a minute, that was the lesson of Solzhenitsyn in Václav Havel. One man could take on the Soviet Union in the name of truth addressed to power. A tiny handful of dissidents, far outweighed by the Soviet military and the tanks and the guns and the KGB, could overcome all that. Truth prevails for those who live in truth. That's the lesson of that, very obviously. But it's also true at a personal level. We all know the name Picasso, Pablo Picasso. He was a genius of an artist, but a monster of a man. 
Even one of his best friends, Alberto Giacometti the sculptor, called him the monster. He had an incredible ego, a devouring ego, like a black hole, and people came into that devouring ego in his orbit, and they were almost devoured. One of his mistresses said Pablo would rape us and then paint. If you read his story, it's remarkable. And there's only one of all his wives, and there were many, and all his mistresses, and there were many more. There was only one who survived him without psychological problems. Picasso himself said, not thinking of the Titanic, where the film hadn't come out then, but he said that when I die, I will go down like a great ship and take many down with me. And when he did die, several of those close to him committed suicide. He was so central to all their lives were that without him, they were nothing. One did survive well. One of his mistresses, actually 40 years younger than Picasso, Françoise, Françoise Gillot. She describes in her book how she did it. She loved him, she said, but she went in with Pablo every day, and she says, like Joan of Arc, wearing the armor of truth. With truth, she could not be manipulated. With truth, there were boundaries. With truth, she was not a doormat. With truth, she was not sucked into the black hole and devoured. But without it, Nietzsche is right. There's no truth. There is only the will to power. And the weak go to the wall, and victory goes to the strong. That's the terrible lesson of our world, which we're bringing on ourselves unless we restore truth in our daily living. Without truth, there is only power and manipulation and bullying. Think of the Me Too movement. Male harassment is vile. But you can see the part hypocrisy in those who are criticizing it because they've espoused the very philosophies of permissiveness and promiscuity and no truth power, that means the more powerful have more power. And of course, men in relation to women and older men, younger women and richer men and poorer women and senior men and young, you name it. Harassment becomes very natural, I'm afraid, in that world. And you can see it's on the one hand vile and we should stand against it, but on the other hand, there's a hypocrisy in those who resisted it because they've espoused the very philosophy that makes so much of it popular. Harvey Weinstein, who's been criticized more than anyone, blamed what he did on the 60s. And he was attacked viciously for what they called his get out of jail free card. But actually there was something to his argument and it was in the 60s that many of these ideas flowered through Michel Foucault and through Playboy and lots of other things. And it's a deeply serious thing that we have to think of in terms of relationships, in terms of families, in terms of businesses, and above all, in terms of our governments. Without truth, there is only power. And we will be manipulated. The other half of the practical consequences are not quite so easy to see, but equally important. Without truth, there is no freedom. That's not so easy to see. When I was at Oxford, I had the privilege, my tutor was in the same college as Isaiah Berlin, the great Jewish philosopher. And he often spoke of freedom. And he is famous for his view of freedom of having two aspects or two faces, negative freedom and positive freedom. Negative freedom is freedom from. Positive freedom is freedom for, freedom to be. And Berlin would argue that both of them are deeply needed for a full freedom. And of course, the Christian would agree and understand. Negative freedom. No one is free while they're under the constraint or coercion of any outside force, whether it's a bully in a playground or a colonial power or whether it's something like alcohol or drugs. If ever we're under the constraint and coercion 
of anything outside our own personal wills, we are not free. And we need negative freedom. Freedom from. But that's only the beginning. It's only the first half of freedom. Full freedom is freedom for, freedom to be. Now, of course, the question is, what are we free for? What are we free to be? You can't answer that unless you know the truth of who you are. Are we animals? Are we machines? Or are we, as Jews and Christians believe, made in the image of God? You need to assume and take seriously the truth of who you are to become free as who you are. G.K. Chesterton put it in a wonderfully simple illustration several times. Imagine you're an animal rights liberator. You want to free every wild animal you can find. I don't know if you have a zoo in Belfast, but think of going to some big zoo, London, wherever it is, if you have one here. And you go in and you see in the first two cages, you see in the first one a tiger with a great concrete hump strapped to its back. And it's lumbering around painfully with this heavy weight. And you look in the next cage and there's a camel. And it's been painted with great thick rubberized orange and black stripes. So it too is constrained and moving with great difficulty. Right, you're a liberator. Obviously you liberate them both from their cages. They are wild animals. But you liberate the tiger from the hump and the camel from the stripes. You don't for a minute think of liberating the tiger from the stripes. That's part of the truth of the tiger. It's tigerishness. And equally, you don't liberate the camel from its hump. That's part of what makes it a camel. In other words, to be free, you need to know the truth of who you are. And without truth, there is no freedom. Now you look around our Western world, and particularly in the younger people, most of the truth is libertarian. Liberals say, get the government off my body so that I can live as I like sexually, and conservatives very often get the government off my bank balance so that I can live how I like economically. But both of them, it's freedom from, without any consideration of freedom for, freedom to be. And so I think we need to take that very seriously, and part of our, those of us who are people of faith, our witness out in the public life, without truth, there is only power and manipulation. And without truth, there is no freedom. Move on to one last point. Truth prevents, presents all of us with a moral challenge. If you look down through history of thinkers and intellectuals, you would think all intellectuals love truth. Isn't that what being a scholar and a thinker and an intellectual is all about? No. No. The evidence and the record shows that many people try and shape truth to conform to their desires. And others have the courage to try and shape their desires to conform to the truth. Now, that's easy to say. It sounds like a play on words. But the reality is sobering. You do have great intellectuals. Plato, Aristotle, are unashamed in their magnificent espousal of truth. Kierkegaard, in his last life, writes in his journal, one thing I want in one word, honesty. The Jewish rabbi, the Kotzker, who is a Hasidic rabbi in Eastern Europe, he says, I want one banner over my life, truth. And there have been great thinkers, great intellectuals, who've been absolutely committed without any equivocation to the pursuit of truth. But many of the others, in his great book, The Intellectuals, Paul Johnson tells the story of many like Rousseau and many others, and shows how again and again and again they shaped the truth to their desires. Take Aldous Huxley. I don't think he's in the book, but it's a very clear example. Huxley went to Oxford. 
And he says in his memoir, when he left Oxford, he decided the world was meaningless. Notice the word there, he decided. He doesn't say, I discovered it was meaningless. I decided it was meaningless. Why? He says, well, for me and my friends, he said, meaninglessness, I'm quoting now, was an instrument of liberation. If the world's meaningless, we can each make our own meaning and live how we like. And he's quite open as a member of the Garsington Circle near Oxford. He wanted to live freely in a day when sexual issues were not as free as they are now. He wanted to be totally free. And so he says, I decided the world was meaningless and meaninglessness for me was an instrument of liberation and I wanted sexual freedom. He's candid, brazenly candid about it and talks about the way he just shapes truth to what he desires. And of course, you follow his life. Not long afterwards, he's incredibly lost and confused and his wandering takes off in another direction. But you can see one example of so many people who live like that. Bill Clinton, President Clinton, spoken here not long ago. Bill Clinton, when the Monica Lewinsky scandal broke out, he admitted as part of his reason for what he did and the lies he told, he said it was the philosophy given him by his mother. And in one word, it's what he called compartmentalism. In other words, you have a dark side, a shadow side, a skeleton in the cupboard, an awkward part, well, cordon it off. Cordon it off and put it in a compartment and pretend it's not part of your reality. So the rest of your reality is fine, but you've got a compartment back there. And he said, I would just compartmentalize things that were awkward. And of course, it caught up with him. But you can see again and again the challenge of truth. The first way to do it, try and shape the truth to make it conform to our desires. But of course, truth is true. Reality is reality. The alternative part of the challenge is to try and conform our desires to the truth. In the short run, that's painful. I'd rather not do this or whatever. But in the long run, it's wonderful because you're in line with reality, with truth. And if the problem in the first strategy, in one word, is compartmentalism, the problem in the, uh, rather, the way, the principle in the second strategy, in one word, is confession. Now, we all know that word. But the word came home to me one day when I was reading Michel Foucault, whom I mentioned earlier, the apostle of power. Michel Foucault, sadly for him, died of AIDS after catching it in the bathhouses of San Francisco before they realized how deadly AIDS was, and so on. He hated the Christian faith, made no bones about it. But he said once there was one thing he admired about the Christian faith, and that was confession, voluntary confession. Why? He said, when a person voluntarily confesses, you have a very rare moral act because someone is going on record against themselves. What they're doing is facing up to the truth. I lied. I cut a corner. I fiddled my t tax returns, whatever it is. When we go on record in confession, we're going on record against ourselves, but we're actually realigning ourselves with truth and with reality. And of course, that challenge comes to us all, and we can see it running through the Bible. Many people try and shape the truth to what they would like, rather than shaping what they would like to what is true and what God likes, which is freedom in the long run. Now, this whole question of truth and power is incredibly important because if the Western world abandons truth, we are in for extremely dangerous times. Historians say that one of the great mysteries of history is why there were so few voices raised against ruthless power. Hardly any. 
And most amazingly, even the people oppressed by power often become obsequious to power because power is spectacular. And power can well become an idol in its own right, as the Bible says, those who worship their own might. I love the fact that some of the first great voices against oppression and injustice were the Hebrew prophets. And they dared to stand against the abuse of power. You go back to many of the early cultures, people only looked after those in their family orbits. Someone was murdered, the family looked after it. And even if they went to law, it would be someone related to the family who, no. The first people who stood for other people long before it happened in Greece and other places were the Hebrew prophets. Those of us tonight who are followers of Jesus, we have incredible stakes in this issue. Our God is the God of truth. Love, yes. Justice, yes. Mercy, yes. Grace, yes. But always with truth. And those who know him can enter this world with oppression and brokenness and injustice and address truth to power and take a stand against the evils of our time. These are not abstract issues. These are not theoretical issues. Countries can fall apart remarkably fast. I think of the way Scotland has changed in a generation from when I was a boy to where it is today. Ireland is very different, but where you could be in 20 years' time if the drift just continues could be incredibly different. The same is true for many of our countries. Without truth, only power. Without truth, no freedom. And what I love and I'm always profoundly grateful for is the more you explore these issues, and I've tried to put it in a reasonably popular way tonight, the more you explore these issues with all the tough thinking of postmodernism, you come round, and at the end of the day, you see the wonder of Jesus. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The tragedy of the Western world is that saying of Jesus is the motto of more universities than any other motto in the world. But while the words adorn the walls, They've sadly been lost from the minds and the hearts of students, professors, political leaders, and countless citizens across our world. Without truth, only power. Without truth, no freedom. And our Lord, I am the way, the truth, the life. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Thank you.